All right, welcome into another episode of Office Hours. We're joined by Erica Nardini, Barstool CEO. And Erica, it was, you know, give or take 15 years before Barstool in your career. Now I've been here three years. Did it feel like 15? <laughs> <laughs> Did, uh, has, has the, has has the, the last has the three, three years felt like, like 15? 15? Yeah, yeah at least. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's pretty constant, but yeah. it's been awesome. It's yeah. a super fun ride. And you guys obviously have leaned into both audio podcasting. You guys just had a big upfront. How do you think that's been transformational for your business as a whole? And then just also so the future of Barstool. I think we're super transformational just because we're boundless yeah. and we don't really think about medium. We're not we're not that calculated in terms of thinking maybe we're stupid or maybe we're really smart whereby it's not like here's our podcast strategy or here's our video strategy or here's our blog strategy. We basically just have really creative people. We let them run. They make content. Some of it's best suited to be in a podcast format. Some people are brilliant at radio. Some are, you know, exceptional writers and they stick to the blog. Some are just funny on social. Uh, some are great in person. Like, so we, we're really, um, there's a chaos to the content creation, which I think really works for us. And, you know, podcasting is obviously really important to us. You know, I've, I've said this a lot, but I, I think that podcasting is an extension of, of the blog, like the, a very pure extension of, hey, this is in my head. This is what I think is funny. This is my reaction to what's happening in sports or entertainment or on the internet or in culture. And that comes to life in a podcast in a way where, you know, we do satire podcasts. We do, you know, evergreen podcasts like Call Her Daddy, which are talking about taboo topics, yeah. all right? And then we do like real time podcasts, which are reacting to, hey, here's what's happening this week in hockey, or here's what's happening right now in golf. So, um, you know, the thing for us is we're just very personality centric, and that personality will find the right places for their own expression. And obviously Barstool Sports started as sports much more than sports. How do you define yourself internally and even externally now as you guys have grown into other verticals? You know, the nice thing is we don't have to define ourselves yeah. as much anymore. Like, you know, I remember one of when I first got here the summer of 2016, everyone was like, what's Barstool Sports? And we were like, hey, we're, you know, started as a regional newspaper, or started as a newspaper in Boston, then became a regional sports blog. But at the end of the day, what we care about is content. And at some point, do you think like Dunkin' dropped donuts, Barstool will drop sports? Oh, I mean, we can't get, <laughs> would we drop sports? I think a lot of times people do drop sports, do. to be honest yeah. with you. Like, I find more people refer to us as Barstool now versus Barstool Sports. I think we've tried to get the URL for barstool.com for, I think there's a, there's like a legendary story of Dave trying to get the URL. He should talk to me. My story was like, it was a premature ejaculation website. The website oh, really? that we were trying to get. Yeah. Huh. It's like, how'd that go? I, I still don't have it. <laughs> yeah. We don't have it either. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's like a big backstory on that, but you know, like it's, it's kind of, we don't care about all the things that everybody else sets up and cares about before they do something. We just don't even bother with that because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. Barstool, Barstool Sports, who cares? Like, yeah. you know it when you see it. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's what I want to protect and grow. And I think you mentioned the differentiating factor is that you're so personality driven. And it's almost weird because it's like people care more about what goes on in here than what really what you guys are producing. Completely. And yeah. The storyline is electric. It's like a reality TV yeah, show. Totally. Do you feel like that will ever translate itself into Hulu, Netflix, working with them on opportunities in terms of like long form video features or We shows? talk to those guys all the time. You know, I, I think we'll see. Yeah. The thing about it is, though, is that Hulu and Netflix are, you know, awesome. I watch a ton of Netflix. Like, I watch Hulu. I watch YouTube TV. Like, but at the end of the day, it's former television, movie, Hollywood execs that run the systems underneath those companies. Like, Net Netflix, obviously, super sophisticated with data. Yeah. But they still want the same things. They want a show that's not super controversial. They want a showrunner who has pedigree associated with the piece of content that's being created. And, you know, from my vantage point, I don't know that we need that. Like, we have a killer reality show. We drop it twice a week. It's called Stool Scenes. Yeah. I, I don't need a big name showrunner to come be attached to Stool Scenes. Like, we love Stool Scenes the way we have it now. Like, yeah. could it make it on a big screen? Yes. 
we have a Roku app. We have, you know, a Fire TV app. We have an Apple TV app. Like, why wouldn't we just put it there ourselves? Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, that's what's so great about disruption and our brand is that you don't need to change for a gatekeeper. And what we've done that I'm, you know, so fired up about is that over the last three years, like, we've become... If you look at my strategy since 2016, like we've become much bigger where we don't need gatekeepers the way we needed gatekeepers in 2018 or right. gatekeepers in 2017 or certainly gatekeepers in 2016. Like in 2016, we were trying to get to California. We had three podcasts and maybe like 10 episodes total. We had a blog that was awesome. We had like nothing on YouTube. Yeah. We had nothing on Facebook. We did pretty li very little on Instagram. Loved Twitter. But like... Now, it, that's what's so dramatic about Barstool is how rapidly that's changed. And now I'm like, hey, like, sure, would I love a show on Netflix? Maybe if it could be the show we want to put on Netflix, yeah. the way we want to put it on, on another place, definitely. How was the uh, first year compared to, like, the third year? And what is, I mean, you said the strategy, but how's, how's the things evolved and changed? I'm sure it's very different. Oh, I mean, the first year was just wild. Like, <laughs> it just was wild. It was 24-7. I, I didn't do anything, but be at Barstool and worry about Barstool 24 seven. Um, I mean, my first summer, we didn't have an office. Dave and I were managing the construction of our first, you know, second headquarters, our first New York headquarters. So like we're dealing with the contractor and you know, Dave and I don't know shit about any of that. So I would have never guessed. Yeah. <laughs> shocking. It's like a bunch of people complain about it. So like we worked out of coffee shops, like there was a coffee shop in the West village. Like that's where I met Dave um, we had, you know, there were all these, there was this huge network of freelancers, semi freelancers, guys in Boston who I'd never met. Um, it, so it was just really getting a handle on what is this amorphous yeah. thing that's yeah. barstool. And then we just started to chip away at stuff, you know? So it, it, the first year was very, very, very hands-on. Like when we went to the Super Bowl that first, and we, we, the thing with Barstool is we just are so fast. Like we have, we did so much so quickly that, you know, we had a TV show on Comedy Central. It was the, it was 2017 Super Bowl. So in Houston and like we all stayed in the same house and there was maybe 32 of us at this company. I think 22 of us worked on that TV show, myself included, like show running this TV show. So like the first year was, it's all been intense. That first year was, I worried a lot and, you know, tried to spark something and yeah. to steer it. And then now it's like, now I don't know, need to go live in the house. So that's, yeah, that's you know, nice. a huge <laughs> bonus. Um, I still worry about us, but, um, I'm so proud and I think we're so such a force. Yeah. You said you you still worry about it. What do you what do you worry about? Oh, everything. Like uh you know, I worry um I care a lot, I guess is a different way to yeah. say it. Like I just really care. I care about our people. I care about you know, I, I care about how are we coming to life on platforms? I care about, like, I'm trying to put all these new things together. Like, we have a huge business operation right now. Production, programming, monetization, distribution. Like, how do we p put all those pieces together and still not lose the magic but also get much bigger? How, how are we using data? How are we intersecting all these things? Who's coming after us? Like, who wants to eat our lunch? So I just think about Barstool all the time. Um, which, you know, I think people in my personal life criticize me for, which I get and is deserved. But I just think this there's never going to be another one of these things. And the ride that we've had is just so it, like I, it's just electric. So I, I just am so grateful to be a part of it and feel feel a lot of commitment and responsibility to keep it going. When Dave and, and the team first approached you, would you ever imagine it to be like this? No, I mean, no. <laughs> I saw, I knew Barstool Sports was just something so radical. I had so much respect for Dave. I think Dave is just genius. Um, I still think that today, uh, you know, even 100 times more than I thought it in 2015, 2016. Um, I knew, you know, when you look at the internet and you look at media, nobody gives a shit about any of these people. They don't. They don't care about the brands. They don't care about the content. They don't care about the personalities. They don't care about the storyline. 
They don't know anything about the business and it's not interesting. And here it's just the exact opposite. So like, I didn't know what shape it would take. We, you know, Dave and I say this all the time. Like everybody's like, what's your five-year plan and your strategy? And we're like, we don't know. Like, <laughs> so I don't know that we would have f- yeah. thought that we would be here, but I always knew that this was something that was just so different. And you said you're worried about people who may come and eat your lunch. You know, you obviously disrupted a lot of traditional guards and traditional people in the media. Who disrupts Barstool or who are you worried about? I don't know. We watch it all. I mean, I look at personalities. I look at YouTube. We look at new platforms. You look at, like, what's happening on TikTok. Like, do we have enough eyes on TikTok? Are we, you know, and the thing that's so cool about Barstool is, like, you say the word gambling and then it just permeates this whole place and everybody starts thinking about what's their take on gambling. Like whether you know how to gamble or you don't know how to sport, you know, you don't know how to bet. Like everybody has a shtick on it. Um, we say, we say the word TikTok, and like Rhea is doing dance videos in the hallway every <laughs> afternoon. And it's like, nobody said to Rhea, like, Hey Rhea, it'd be really good for you to have a strategy for, for TikTok. She doesn't have a strategy. She just wants to make dance videos with six other random people here. So like, I love that. And that's why I feel so confident about our future is because there's this osmosis in this house. Yeah. There's an osmosis in this house where people just catch on fire and things, you know, Dave and I were talking about it at our upfront this week where we always laugh because someone told them the story once about how there was a meeting at a big media company uh, and it was a meeting about how to be more authentic because it was like the authenticity meeting and the subject of community the community is the yeah. authenticity. Yeah, is authenticity is the new community. Yeah. And in this meeting, they're like, how do we get more authentic? And it's like, dude, if you're having a fucking meeting about how to be authentic, like it's never <laughs> probably not happen. authentic. <laughs> and for us, it's just so like the authenticity isn't just about the content and the point of view. It's just that like literally someone says the word TikTok and there's, a hundred fires of people creating TikToks. Are so, you going to be creating TikToks? No, I'm not. No, I, no, it's no. actually funny. I had that thought last night where I was like, Sh- should I be on TikTok? Like, I don't know what <laughs> I would do. You should do behind the scenes on TikTok. I, mean, I'm, I, I highly doubt that I would be appealing to a TikTok audience. But <laughs> I, I think that what's cool is that there's there's just such constant experimentation. It The energy, I mean, I don't know if you feel it here. Like yeah. the energy here is just so awesome. And that's why I would bet on us. Hundred, hundred times out of a hundred. And one of the things you did do, and and it, you know, a year ago, right? You had Van Talk. It was canceled, mm-hmm. like almost to this day, a year ago. Two years right? ago. Two years yep. ago. Excuse me. Two years ago. Sorry. Um, do you think if that would have gone through, and if it would have worked out differently, Barstool's business would be different than it is today? You know, there's there's probably some mixed opinion on that. Like Hank talked about this the other day, where you know, had Van Talk gone well. Uh, first of all, I think the show was awesome. Yeah. Just outright awesome. Single best thing to ever be on ESPN, um, which is infinitely biased, but I still believe it. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, I think you, you got to wonder if the show was successful, like what would have, what could have become for pardon my take the yeah. brand. I don't personally have any regrets at all. Um, because personally, I think for Hank a- and for us, like the inspiration and, kind of the wackiness of Van Talk really fueled advisors, sports advisors, which I think is one of the single best shows to come out of Barstool. I also think we would have spent a lot of time bringing audience and creating content for someone else versus spending that time in creating content and bringing audience to Barstool. And to be honest, like that kind of gets back to like how I think our strategy has changed is that like two years ago, I needed other platforms to grow yeah. and other, there were some awesome other platforms who opened up their doors to us. Sirius XM, awesome partner. Um, even Snapchat, like Snapchat let us in, we rose to the top, then we started to do more with Snapchat. So uh, Facebook, like Facebook sees something with our audience and our content that they just don't see with any other sports or sports media brand. So there were partners who really helped, really helped, genuinely, truly helped us along the way. There were partners who did not help us along the way. I don't have any regrets about any of it. I I think our ability to be fluid has been really important. And I don't, you know, it's funny, we get pitched all the time. I got pitched yesterday about taking some of our brands and putting it exclusively on someone else's platform. And I just don't know if that's our path anymore. Yeah. 
And I don't think we would have known that had we not had the Van Talk experience, if we hadn't been on Comedy Central, if we hadn't done Sirius. Like, we kind of know what works for us and what doesn't work for us. And being true to what works and what doesn't is one of our biggest strengths is we're just honest. So how do you see those partnerships playing out then, right? Serious Snapchat going forward. Is, is it something where you now come back from and you build internally or is it you still work with those people externally? We'll always want, you know, we want to be where our audience is. Yeah. So like, hey, people are, you know, college kids are all over Snapchat or Instagram or Telegram or TikTok or SiriusXM or the blog. Like we will always want to have to be to put our stuff where people are watching other stuff or where we can make them laugh and resonate. So I always think we'll have a very distributed strategy where we are a network in in our own right. The difference with our network is we own certain pipes. We own we have a very strong O and O, but we also have big because no one really ever helped us financially. Like when you look at most media brands right now, everybody talks about, you know, like, hey, Vox sold, Vice sold three podcasts to Spotify. Like, so, so Vice, a media company, is becoming a content production company for a platform company that's basically trying to take eyeballs and ears from the media company and bring it to their platform. So, so when you look at us, nobody's writing us the check, really. They're coming more often than they used to, but no one's really <laughs> writing a check to be like, hey, put all your stuff over here. And to be honest with you, because we've had to fight and claw and earn our way to every piece of real estate that we have, that makes us, one, way more in tune with all of those places. Like, I think we understand the internet better than anyone because we just watch it literally all day and all night. And then two, it enables us, because we don't have any cushion, like, we have to figure it out. We have to make it grow. We have to figure out ways to make money, period. And how have the conversations changed? You said more people are coming to you, writing the checks. Like, what have those conversations, advertisers, platforms, partners, how have they evolved to being, like, I'm sure in the early days it was, like, who's Barstool? Oh, what is totally. Like, I'm probably, like, worried Everyone about, was like, what? What's Barstool? Like, <laughs> even worried about, like, regional like, sports blog? Like, platform, like, uh, safety, you know? Like, oh, yeah. Like, we get that. I get annoyed by that because I think there's, like, I get annoyed and I don't get annoyed. So I get annoyed because there's this distraction conversation about the quote unquote controversy of Barstool yeah. Sports. And part of me says like, okay, fine. If you want to focus on that one narrative that exists when you do a Google search, that's cool. Part of Part of me gets annoyed because I actually don't think that's the story of this company at all. It's just more salacious than the rest of it. So it, it just takes the air, you know, can take the air out of the room. The other part of me, I kind of like it because I'm like, well, all of you all are focused over here. Like, I'm going to, like, go make hay while the sun is shining and yeah. nobody's watching. So I, I think it cuts both ways for us, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm kind of not immune to it. I, I wouldn't say I'm immune to it, but I'm desensitized to it. I also think that, look, brands, the world has changed. Like, the Internet has changed everything Young consumers are very different. They have so much choice. There's so much competition. Instagram is a mall, right? It's a flat out mall. Yep. And if you want a 20 year old, a 27 year old, a 15 year old to buy your stuff, you got to find a way to break through for them in a world where they have infinite choice. There is constant distraction and they do not want to be pushed. They don't want to be pushed. Like I was watching, I was watching the Chiefs Chiefs game last night, the Broncos, and I was like looking at the commercials and I was like, God, there's like, the commercials don't break through. You yeah. can tell the characters aren't real. Like there was this one commercial, I forget, I literally forget what it was for because <laughs> it was so unmemorable. But I'm yeah. like, you're not, that 30 second spot probably cost you let's say between 70 and $250,000, you paid a million dollars for the production of that commercial. None of it feels real. None of it resonates. And a, a young guy who's a Broncos fan isn't going to be like, yeah, I'm going to go out and buy that. What a Broncos fan is going to buy is like someone who he trusts, someone who he feels stands for something that he identifies with and who he thinks – and products that he thinks badge him as part of something. And I think that's what's changed in the world and why we're so valuable is because we have all those things and you cannot buy those things. Like you cannot become trustworthy. You cannot 
buy your way to authenticity. Like you can't, you can't get that. And then it's further like, then it's, it's further exacerbated by the reality that like most people in those companies don't understand the internet. So it just compounds itself. Like if you don't have eyes for the thing you're creating, you can't create something that breaks through and resonates and has trust. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. It's like and a like, big rant. No, that's fine. More rants, the yeah. better, right? All right. right. <laughs> be here all day, ranting. I'm having Let a ranting all, type l- week. Yeah, l- ranting on Twitter, right? I, think I know, I did a have a big Twitter rant this a week. A big podcast yep. Twitter rant. Um, but no, I mean, commerce, obviously, you kind of touched mm-hmm. on that. You guys having that arm. Shirts, mm-hmm. Pink Whitney deal. Where does commerce for Barstool go from here, and how do you see it fitting into long-term like success of the business? I mean, commerce was the thing that Dave and I hit on literally in our first conversation like I owned so many barstool t-shirts like I loved the Gronk 69 t-shirt I had the hate they hate us because and I think I I think when I was interviewing I think somebody went and looked at my purchase history just to be sure I wasn't like bullshitting it and I was like no I've been buying fucking t-shirts you have my you have my credit card information I promise (laughs) and also like don't violate my PI but whatever um so Commerce, what I always loved about Barstool Commerce is that wearing a Fire Goodell t-shirt or they hate us because they ain't us t-shirt, that's not buying a t-shirt. That's like being part of something. Um, You see it in the numbers for, so that was, you know, they hate us because they ain't us was like 2014, maybe 2013, 14. That. People buying Pink Whitney's by the case. Like, no one buys flavored vodka by the case ever. I think I had my worst night ever in college on flavored vodka. I'm sure. You know? And the Pink Whitney can do that for you, too. But, like, people are buying Pink Whitney because it stands for something. They love chiclets. They, they're they into Whitney. Like, it's a, it's a statement about something. It's not a flavored vodka. So our commerce strategy is like, I don't even really think about it as a commerce strategy. I'm, I more think about like, how do I make, you know, how do I make the conversations that are happening, the humor, the statement, the movement, the like, the, the tribes, the like fan groups that we're creating, how do I just give them something to wear that feels part of the story of the show? Like yeah. I'm wearing like an I'm unwell daddy hoodie, right? Like I am unwell is a is a genius theme that Alex and Sophia created as part of Call Her Daddy. It's not a sweatshirt. Yeah, we care about the make of the sweatshirt and the color and the price point and how we how we sell it or where we sell it. But really it's like be, it's more so about being part of something. And when fans feel part of something and there's a content experience that becomes a commerce experience, you almost like you don't differentiate between the two. So what would you say to these, the everyone who's talking about content to commerce now in 2019 when you guys were doing it? I, in I think like if you don't have a brand that people care about, nobody is going to buy your T-shirt. A viral T-shirt, a T-shirt that has a slogan about something will go so far A T-shirt that has a slogan that has meaning will go much, much, much further. Um, You know, we had T-shirts on Tuesday. Like Dave had this huge thing on Tuesday. It wasn't a. We weren't like, hey, we got to get the commerce up numbers up on Tuesday. Dave was looking at what was happening with LeBron James, talking about China, the hypocrisy around free speech, and dropped two T-shirts. Those two T-shirts went bananas sales wise. Not because everyone's dying to have a LeBron t-shirt from Barstool Sports, but because it's like, this is ridiculous. It's funny. I want to wear it. I can wear it this weekend. It'll be topical. So I think that there's a lot of companies who are saying we need a commerce strategy. It's just like people saying we need a... uh, it's a video strategy. We need a video strategy. We need a um, subscription strategy. Like everybody's just... Everyone who is dependent on programmatic ad revenue to fuel their business is looking at decreasing margin and decreasing efficacy and lower flat to lower revenue numbers. So they're trying to augment those with new numbers. Now, the reality is the subscription business, the commerce business, the live event business is much harder and very hard. Very hard. Very it's hard. a lot more work than yeah. selling advertising. Yeah. And it grows slower. It's more uneven. It's more unpredictable. So um, 
so th- that's what's hard is like you can't flip the switch from like, oh, hey, we were an ad programmatic ad business and now we're going to be a commerce business. Like it doesn't work that way. How have subscriptions been for you guys? It's good. Like we, you know, we launched gold a year ago, a year ago in January. Um, we launched gold a year ago in January. I'm really proud of our tech team. I think that we have, and that's what's, you know, what I'm also really excited about with Barstool is like we have a team. It's not just the content team that punches above their weight and is mighty with small numbers. Like our whole company is like that. Um, built a really great product. We, you know, we are seeing success in terms of Stooley signing up and joining. I don't think we've nailed it, to yeah. be honest, at all. I think we haven't figured out what the offering should be. I think we're still debating what the value proposition looks like. We're really grateful to all the stoolies who are part of it. Bringing our fans closer to us is really important. Um, you know, we struggle with it, to be honest with you. Like, I'll give you an example. We have all the Barstool documentaries in gold. And I think our documentaries are just the most captivating whole, whole per- portrayal of the history of this company. We're only showing those to a fraction of our audience. And I think about the misperceptions or just the intrigue around Barstool. Those documentaries would be so powerful to be broadcast more broadly. Right now we have them in our subscription product. Is that right? Is that wrong? Like, I don't think we know. So we're still figuring it out. How much time for you is spent on on figuring it out? Or like, what does that like look like now that the business is so diversified? Where are you focusing the efforts? I'm assuming it's probably in, across everything, but like, yeah, what's like, like the biggest thing for you? I, I spend a lot of time thinking about, spend a lot of time with lawyers. <laughs> always <laughs> I was on gonna... with the lawyers. Uh, <laughs> never talked to, I like started my career in a legal department and thinking that I absolutely hated lawyers and I didn't want to be a lawyer. Now that's all I do. But it's from a good <laughs> now side you, of Now the you table. love them, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. no, they love me because I ever spent so much money that's with them. It. But um, I spend a lot of our time thinking about talent, whether it's talent we're bringing onto the platform, talent we have inside this company. I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, how what what's next for the brand and brands that we're growing. Like, where should those go? What should those be like? I spend, you know... I spend a lot of time thinking about how do we harness the things that are organically coming out of Dave and his team. Um, You know, the the most incredible thing about our personalities, like we have 64 of them now, is like they're just always on to something. So there's so much to work with, uh, which I love. So I spend a lot of time like how do we harness this? How, you know, how could we, what could we do with this? Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, our fans and, you know, what are we asking from them? How do we, you know, if we're, we're invested obviously very deeply into Barstool bets, like sports betting is going to be a really big focus for us. You know, is the bets fan different than a core stoolie? How do we think about appealing to them? How do we make content for them? What's the distribution for them? You know, as we bring pro, pro as we build products and services to, to like bring people closer to us, like what do those look like? I think about what are we doing off platform versus on platform. I'm trying to look up more in the world now. Like I, my first two years, I literally did not watch a movie, read a book, like go to a conference, do any of that. So I'm trying to do more of that now. Um, For better or worse. Yeah, for better or worse. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. it was awesome. I don't like, I loved every second of it. I think we're the most interesting thing going. So I'm like. (laughs) You were living it. Yeah, if I was working in insurance and couldn't do anything else, (laughs) I'd be sad, but it's not that. So, So those are things I spend time on. And for you, when you go, is it too, is it building all these owned and operated and fulfilling these personalities or even like looking at more acquisitions, things like that? Obviously, Rough and Rowdy, you have totally. Old all Row. Of that. Like, how does, how does that play into the overall Barstool strategy as, as you guys grow? I think we do best when we find something very early and we incorporate it and make it part of Barstool. Like, whether it's a personality or a brand or frankly, even, a, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at platforms and betting. Like, I think we do best when we work with something at a very early age, or early stage, and then we put our gasoline on it and we incorporate it into, you know, into the house. Um, so I'm I'm always looking at stuff. We, we get stuff thrown at us all day long in terms of, you know, hey, hire me, look at this, hire me, look at this, here's a podcast. Um, so we have a lot to sift through. Um, but, you know, I think ultimately... I think we got to keep it barstool. Yeah. We really got to keep it barstool. And so keeping it barstool means like finding and growing like this kid last night, the Jack McCarthy, I think is his name. Like 
I mean, that's a kid who had like a social media job here. And now, you know, his face is plastered all over the Internet as being like the guy who stands up to Dave. Like, we didn't see that coming. Yeah. That's not what we hired him for. Could he be a great he's, he could be fired right now for all I know. But, yeah. you know, could is that a, that's how we're going to do things is just creating the, putting new things into the chaos and seeing what what hits. And that could be a company, that could be a technology, that could be a business person, that could be a personality, that could be a podcast. And that's because you feel like you guys have set yourself up for success because you've been so accessible, I'm assuming, and you know what your people want. Yeah, we know what, we just pay attention only to what our fans want. And we're not, you know, we're, we're pretty loose. Like, we're just pretty, we're not, we don't suffocate things. It's like, there's no helicopter parent here, if that makes sense. Like, we're loose and free and therefore things can incubate and grow. Like I watch, you know, to the example of Rhea on TikTok, like I watch Rhea like going after TikTok and I'm like, you know what? Like maybe that will not amount to anything, but like I look at how she's attacking it and I'm like, that could very well be something. I'm not doing anything about it. I'm like enjoying watching her do it. There's going to come a point in time where I'm like, Hey, let's talk about this. Let's see what we could do with it. And I, I think it's truly that organic here. Yeah. Do you think there's a ceiling at some point in terms of like podcast listeners, right? Like how many podcasts can you have? You know, are people who are only caller daddy podcast people, are they not just like your hardcore stoolies, right? And I'm assuming they are, but like, is there at some point where it's like all the people are the same, they're just listening to things differently? I don't think that we, I think we're expanding our audience. You see that, yeah. you know, we've gone from maybe six million uniques to, you know, when you look across the network, like 90. So I, we're obviously growing our audience a lot. Yeah. I, I do think there's, there's a cap on how much you can ask people to listen to and watch and read every day. Like I, I look at that. I also, that's where I think we can be smarter of like, Hey, not, you know, sometimes you only want to read Dave's blogs or sometimes you're, you know, you only want to watch you. How, how many hours a day do you have to watch Barstool? And are those audiences all the same? Like they're not like our fans on Instagram aren't necessarily blog readers. Yeah. Caller daddy fans aren't necessarily chicks in the office fans. Like could, could there be crossover? Probably maybe. Uh, is there a crossover between pardon my take and spit and chicklets? Definitely. Um, but we're, I think we appeal to, you know, 12 year olds to 60 year olds and, you know, on TikTok, like, is it, not to keep talking about TikTok, yeah. but like TikTok is like 15 year old girls. Like it's really very similar to what we're doing on Instagram, which is 25 year old guys. So it's like we're, we're just we're we're intuitive to what each platform looks like and what the audience on those platforms wants. Yeah. And so long as we keep doing a good job of that, there won't be a cap. If we start to suck at that, there will definitely be a cap. Definitely. And, and as, as you guys go forward, obviously, you, you have the relationship with NASCAR. Mm-hmm. What is what is what was that like? How did that come about? How has that been for you guys? Do you envision more of these working with more of these properties? Right. You obviously you're big into golf. Is it PGA Tour next? Is it, you know, something else? You have big NFL presences like where, where does this go with the? Leagues? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, this week it came out on Monday or on Tuesday. It came out that the Talladega race this year was the most streamed race in NASCAR history. And there is one reason for that, which is Dave Portnoy streamed that race live on Sirius XM, which then was distributed across all of our social channels. All of our personalities were watching that race, and it was electric. We were into it. There were crashes. It was a great product from NASCAR. But the difference with this race at Talladega was Barstool Sports. And... To me, that's awesome. That's exactly what we should be doing, which is fans watching the game or the race, having fun with it, being invested in it, talking about it, you know, reacting to one another on it. Like that to me is what is so awesome and electric about this company, which is us watching a NASCAR race made hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people also watch a NASCAR race. We got so many tweets on Monday, Tuesday, even Wednesday, even up until this morning of like, hey, I've never, ever been interested in NASCAR. I didn't even I wouldn't have even known that there was a race and I'm watching it. Yeah. Same thing that happened with the Yankees Astro game when Ellie called it. You know, people were like, I never knew I needed this. I muted my TV 
and to put on the volume of Ellie explaining the game. And, and it was awesome. It was the single best viewing experience I've ever had. So, you know, I think we are fans of sports and we will cover those sports in a way that's uniquely Barstool. It's great for NASCAR. The NASCAR folks are thrilled. They invest a lot in us to be on location, to meet the drivers, to promote the sport, to create energy around the races themselves and the entire NASCAR culture, which is an awesome culture. Um, NASCAR fans are, are, Barstool fans are very similar to NASCAR fans. Like it's tribal, which yeah. is awesome. Now that came about where NASCAR did an ad program with us for us to come on site at, I think it was at Daytona 500 and to be part of the Daytona 500 experience. Dave flat out was like, I don't know shit about NASCAR. I don't even think I like NASCAR. What am I doing? He went, he got hooked and it has become a thing unto itself. So insofar as like, we actually invested our own dollars in a team and a driver, Matt DiBenedito. Yep. And we had Frankie's one bike car on Monday. So it was like, that's the, that's the barstool difference is like an ad sponsorship of like, hey, you know, can you come promote this race? Um, you know, one, we did that and had an amazing impact on the ratings. Ratings in non-NASCAR markets were up 32 to 35 percent all the way to like now we're taking our dollars. We're making merch. We're designing a car. We've got a relationship with a driver. We're doing a live stream on Sirius XM. We're not doing that because anyone's paying us to do it. We're actually interested in NASCAR and the energy and the fandom and the excitement and the performance we can drive is is because it it just moves that organically. So, yeah, NASCAR is going to be a huge thing for us. We love NASCAR. Golf is a huge thing for us. We love the USGA. Like we have done a ton with them at the US Open. They have a fantastic team. They get us, we get them. Um, you know, baseball, you see, like we're always obviously going to cover traditional sports. Those leagues, I think, are more conservative. They are more um, focused on the monetization of their assets with media companies. Yep. Um, but there's going to be a point, you know, people come to us when they're like, Hey, we need young fans and we need young fans to care about the product. So, so long as we keep doing that, which we will, like, I think we should have great relationships. I mean, there'll obviously be some exceptions to that, but yeah, you mentioned the relationships with the athletes. How does that play into the future too, as, as well? I mean, obviously the, the, ra the race car driver and, and, and as you guys have done in the past. And I mean, obviously everyone knows you've use people's likenesses probably without yeah. their permission like oh you're at there in the attorney so how does that change going forward in terms of merch commerce everything i mean athletes we love athletes we're big fans of theirs you know we when i got to barstool i don't the only guests we ever had we found ourselves probably through dms that <laughs> our personalities made now we have hundreds of guests through here like yeah. probably nearly a thousand guests we've had this year Big names, athletes, media personalities, celebrities. They want to do pizza reviews. They want to be on Pardon My Take. They, you know, are talking to chicklets. Like, they're coming into the office and doing live streams. They're on the rundown. They're doing the corp. Um, so, you know, athletes, you know, one, it's hard to be an athlete in a social media age because, one, there's just obviously a lot of pressure. There's a lot of conversation about your contract there is a lot of opinion on your performance. And we're different from other traditional media outlets whereby, you know, everybody's going to ask you the same question. There's going to be a gotcha in there. There's like big J journalism. We don't have that. We're like, hey, you know, Gronk, you want to come in here and throw a football with A-Rod and do a pizza review? Like, sounds good, yeah. you know? Yeah. So we become, I think, a more of a safe space. So, you know, we'll continue to do that. We're starting to work with athletes you know, Charlie McAvoy plays for the Bruins. Like we helped create his logo and merchandise. We, you know, we do, we're doing that with a bunch of, ad, of athletes. We have a partnership with Baker Mayfield where we benefit Special Olympics. Like, so we're doing all sorts of stuff with athletes. Um, I think it's cool. I, I'm actually super interested in that. And, you know, what I like is that we bring them into our world in a way that's just very comfortable and, and all the right things should fall out of that. And as you go forward, do you think Pink Whitney is a one-hit wonder in terms of an athlete thing, or do you think there's more Pink Whitneys in, in, in Barstool? Oh, no. Pink Whitney isn't a one-hit wonder. Yeah. Pink Whitney is awesome. I mean, we've done a million bottles in six weeks. We are the third biggest flavored vodka in the world. 
we're the number one selling alcohol in the state of Illinois, which is just bananas, <laughs> I think. Uh, but it's not a one hit wonder. But we yeah. we need we want to be choosy, right? We want to do the right thing. I don't want to do, you know, ten flavored vodkas with five different brands here. Like I'm not interested so not in be that. An Erica flavored vodka. No, definitely no. not. No, definitely not. No one would buy that. You talked about being an athlete in a social media world. How's it been like being a CEO, especially of this company in a social media world? I I love my job. Like I I'm really really happy at Barstool. I also. Um, I think I have a lot of the same DNA that Barstool has, which is like, I don't need, I, I'm, I, I'm self deprecating. I am pretty real. Like I show the process on social, uh, which I think is interesting. I'm interested in it. Um, I think a lot of CEOs try to be like executive and are very controlled about their image and they're controlled about, their access points, even to their own employees, like they're controlled in their messaging. I don't feel like that personally. Um, I have a huge open, like I, I know every single person at this company and I like it that way. And I want to be connected with everyone doing all the things because that's the only way I'm going to help us be better and be really intuitive to what's actually working and actually not working. Like I think a lot of CEOs spend time being quote unquote CEOs, which is people probably criticize me for that. Like I would rather spend a day doing stuff with people in here than going to talk to, you know, you know, being at a cocktail party yeah. in, in some official capacity. Like I'm just not good at that. I'm not very interested in that. Um, and I also think that like it is what it is. Like some days we crush it. And, I, and some days we suck and yeah. some days I crush it and some days I suck. So like being honest about that and being open about it in social is I don't really know another way. So yeah. that's kind of how it goes. Yeah. How's the relationship grown with, with Dave and changed over the years? It hasn't changed that much. Like yeah. Dave's the best, best person I've ever worked with, best partner I have ever had, probably will ever have. So I love working with Dave. I knew I would love working with Dave from the minute I met him, which wasn't under, it, it wasn't in an interview capacity. I just met Dave through a mutual friend. Um, I think we're great partners. I think that we have together made something really awesome happen. I respect you know, I, I respect what he does so much. And I think he has a lot of respect for the business side. I think we understand what, I think we just have a good, we have a good dynamic partnership. So, you know, you didn't talk about the five-year plan, but if you had to do anything or want to focus on anything, what's next? What's, what's like Barstool three years? What's, you know, your like guiding light or for you, like the one thing that you could get done in like 2020? Oh God. Um, I mean, hopefully, like having them clean up after themselves. After <laughs> That's a start, right? That's a, a start. Yeah, it's a start. Um, I care about bets. Yeah. I care about sports betting. I think the U.S. is such an awesome market for sports betting because if you go to the U.K. or you go to Ireland, you go to comp you go to countries where betting is cultural. Everybody has an uncle or a grandfather or a dad who bet, and you come to the U.S. and there are guys who know. Dave is a you know expert better. Um, now you could you put that expert in quotes. quotes yeah. yeah, you can put that in quotes. <laughs> Same with Dan. Like yeah. we just have have guys here who have been betting for a very long time. Yeah. Culturally, though, in the U.S., that is not the case. And I think we're going to be generation zero culturally of like how to bet betting as an engagement to what you know the the game within the game, like betting as a part of watching sports. I think that we are going to be probably one of the single biggest cultural forces in that. So I care a ton about that. That that will be an area where we'll focus. Um, we're kind of experimenting with it now. Like yeah. you saw, you see it with the live streams, you see it with the content we're making, you see it with our games that we're building. Um, we'll do more podcasts for sure. Uh, we'll think about how those podcasts become videos and become t-shirts and become vodkas and all that kind of stuff. Um, those, I think, are the things you'll see us keep doing. I think you will see us. We're very critical company. We're very blunt. Like, we are very, um, we take this really seriously. Uh, and uh, I think you'll just see us stay really committed to that. And 
you'll see us screw up and succeed and laugh about it in the middle. Like, yeah. I think that's what you're going to, that's guaranteed what you're going to see. Any more products or apps like one bite in development, but yeah. not ready to talk about. Got you. Got you. How's, how's the success been for one? Uh, bite? I mean, one bite's amazing. Yeah. A million people use one bite single biggest database of pizza in the world. I would argue one bite is the best food show on the planet. Yeah. How have you leveraged that then the 1 million? I mean, we're doing, you know, we have a pizza contest right now. We're looking for the best pizza place on, you know, 250 college campuses. So, you know, there's a ton of controversy and excitement and people are pissed off because it's this pizza place versus that pizza place. Like we haven't lever, I would say, quote unquote, leveraged yeah. one bite. There's a ton we can do around pizza. Um, kind of the same thing. Barstool though. pizza shop. Maybe, maybe. like maybe. One day. Dave's particular about his pizza, okay. so we like gotta get it right. Yeah, imagine him rating his own pizza. I know, right? <laughs> Which he would do. Well, yeah, you see, like ESPN, right? They had a bar at one yeah, point. Yeah, totally. Who knows? Yeah, Could ESPN zone. Totally. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. If you do, make sure to take a screenshot of the rating slash review and share it on social media to get some front office sports swag. We'll see you next time.